Thank you, Andy, for leading that prayer of confession. I wanna invite you to stay in a posture of prayer with me as we prepare our hearts and minds to hear God's word today. And again, wherever you are, I wanna, I'm just gonna give us uh, maybe 15, 20 seconds of silence just to be still and to wait on the Lord and to get present uh, to what God may wanna be speaking to you personally today. Lord, we come before you, and as the, the psalmist invites us, we, we become still. And we wanna know you more today. So we take a moment just to be, uh, be silent. And now, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together in all the places we are this morning be pleasing and acceptable to you, our, our rock and our redeemer. Uh, Jesus, I pray that you would be present and that you would speak, that we would encounter you this morning. It's in the name of Christ we pray, and all of God's people said, amen. So as I mentioned earlier, uh, we started a new sermon series last Sunday on the story of Abraham and Sarah, which is found in the Old Testament book of Genesis, the first book of the Bible. That story really does begin, basically it, it begins in Genesis chapter 12, a little bit towards the end of chapter 11, and we're calling it blessed to be a blessing. And I, I mentioned this last week, but I love this phrase that the Apostle Paul uses in his letter to the Christians in Galatia, in Galatians, when he says that Abraham and Sarah's story is really the gospel in advance. It's the gospel in advance. That, that mission and good news is not something that we don't get to the New Testament with Jesus, but that it, it really is at the very heart of who God is and how God is on the move in this world, and it goes all the way back. Uh, to, to Genesis, and that in Abraham and Sarah's sor uh, story, we, we see the seed of the gospel that is beginning to culminate, and it grows, and it reaches its climax in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So one of the things that we've mentioned with this series is that we really want to get at it through a missional lens um, and see how, how this story reveals to us that, that God at his heart is a missional God. And that we, as God's people then, are called to be on mission with God. Uh, that's, that's what it means to be the church. We began with Genesis 12, verses 1 through 9 last week. Um, and in those first nine verses, we, we see Abraham and Sarah. And remember that their names are going to be changed later in the story. So for now, it's Abram and Sarai. I may say them interchangeably this morning. But we see in them a remarkable faith a faith that trusts God even when the details of God's plan is unknown to them. They leave their country, they leave their people, their tribe, they leave their father's house, and they go to the place that God will show them, again, without having any details uh, in terms of where this will be, how long it will take to get there, and what it will be like when they do get there. Now, wrapped into this call, uh, this command then to go, is also a promise. The command and the promise go together. The promise is that God will bless them and will make their name great, and through their offspring, their descendants, God will bless all the families of the earth. Again, the scope of God's mission is not just for them, but through them, God's, uh, the scope of God's mission is for all the nations and the entire creation. But we don't have to get very far in the story of Abraham and Sarah to see that they run into trouble. We saw that even last week. We didn't focus on it as much. I'm gonna talk about that here today. Uh, but when they arrived to the land of Canaan, and I think we've got a map. Ross is gonna put that up for us. You can see the, the red Haran up at the top is where they start. And so follow the red line for Abraham and Sarah. But when they, when they uh, arrive down to the land that God shows them, which is down by Shechem and Bethel, there next to the Mediterranean Sea, uh, when they get there, and we're not sure how long it takes for them to get there, but when they get there, when they arrive, surprise, they find that there are people who are already occupying the land. I mean, wait a minute. How, how's this supposed to work? I thought that this land was the land that God had promised them. It wasn't what they were expecting. 
So the Lord speaks to Abram again and assures him of the promise. He says, to your offspring, I will give this land. And Abraham builds an altar there to the Lord. They're at Bethel in between. They're kind of in between Bethel and, and I um, in, in the Negev desert. Then, then Abram moved his family and his servants to the hill country on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent. This is what the narrator tells us. And he built another altar to the Lord and he called out to the Lord. But then things take a major turn for the worse. After a while of living as nomads in this area, a severe famine strikes. Abraham and Sarah try to stick it out, but the land ends up being as barren as Sarah's womb, and now they are at risk of starving to death. This isn't the life of blessing that they had anticipated. This, this, remember that blessing comes from the Hebrew word barak, and it means this idea of flourishing, of abundance, of goodness. And this, this hardly feels like flourishing or abundance or goodness. Where is God in all of this? Why is this happening? And what should they do? Well, that's where our story picks up today. And so we're gonna hear from Genesis chapter 12. We're gonna pick up at verse uh, 10. And if you have your Bible with you, that may even be a a way to kind of keep you engaged, especially via live stream this morning, if you wanna pull out your Bible. And you can even just keep it open, whatever translation you have. What I wanna do is I'm gonna read, I wanna read the story in its entirety here. We're gonna go down to to chapter 13, verse four. And then... um, and then we're gonna, we're gonna talk about it. We're gonna walk through it together. So hear the word of the Lord from Genesis chapter 12, beginning at verse 10. Now there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to reside there as an alien, for the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife Sarai, I know well that you are a woman who is beautiful in appearance. And when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Please say that you are my sister so that it may go well with me because of you and that my life may be spared on your account. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And when the officials of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house And for her sake, he dealt well with Abram. And he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female slaves, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this that you've done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say, she's my sister? so that I took her for my wife. Now then, here is your wife, take her and be gone. And Pharaoh gave his men orders concerning him and they set him on the way with his wife and all that he had. So Abram went up from Egypt and, all, and, and his wife and all that he had and Lot, remember Lot is his nephew, with him into the Negev. Now Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold. He journeyed on by stages from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning. So back to chapter 12, verse eight, where it was in the beginning. Between Bethel and Ai to the place where he had made an altar at first and there Abraham had called on the name of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So one of the things I wanna say before we jump into this together is you may not know this, but uh, Pastor Kurt, who's the Hospers campus pastor, he and I meet every Tuesday uh, to do text study together. And we engage the scripture for the upcoming sermon together and we listen to God uh, together through the scripture, asking God, what do you have to say to to each of our campuses? And I know that that Kurt prepared his own sermon for this for today and uh, isn't getting to preach it and, uh, but was grateful we share our sermon manuscripts with each other and so I benefited greatly from Kurt's work and I uh, just want you to know that I feel like I kind of have Pastor Kurt's voice with me in the pulpit this morning. So let's talk about this part of the story. It's a strange part of the story and maybe even one we might scratch our heads and say, why, why, why is this part here? I mean, this whole life of blessing is not working out at all like Abraham and Sarah had expected. 
I mean, Abraham and Sarah left everything. They risked it all to trust God and to obey his command. And this is what they get? I mean, not only is the land already occupied, but then there's this severe famine. I, I wonder if they were thinking to themselves, did we make a mistake? I mean, should we have just stayed back at, at Haran? After all, they had two key rivers, Mesopotamian rivers that were right there that produced all kinds of food and, and, and a great water supply. Um, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe this was a bad idea for them to set out on this journey. So Abraham makes a decision I mean, this is life and death as this famine strikes. He makes a decision to head south to Egypt, and he does this for the sake of his family's survival. Now, I don't know if you notice this in the story, but there's no mention by the narrator of Abraham uh, talking to God about this decision. He doesn't seem to consult God. Now, maybe he did, um, and, and God was silent, or maybe he's just kind of at this point ticked off at God. Or maybe he's anxious and fearful, and he's decided that, look, I, I, don't, I guess I can't count on God to kind of come through, so I'm gonna take matters into my own hands. I mean, I know what that's like. I'm guessing you have too. The narrator tells us, so Abram went down to Egypt to reside there as an alien because the famine was severe in the land. And then he says this, when Abram was about to enter Egypt, he said to his wife, Sarai, I know well that you are a woman beautiful in appearance, and when the Egyptians see you, they will say, this is your wife, uh, this is his wife, and then they will kill me, but they will let you live. You know, this, this detail about Sarah being a beautiful woman who's a head turner may kind of catch us by surprise because you may be thinking, wait a minute, I thought that like she and Abraham were in their 60s or 70s at this point. And no offense to anybody in their 60s and 70s, you can certainly be very physically attractive when you're in your 60s and 70s, but it's, it seems like, would this really be a, a strong concern for Abram that these Egyptian men are gonna see uh, his, his, his older wife and, and wanna you know, desire her and wanna take her as their own? It, it could be that, that Sarah just ages really well. Um, interestingly, some Bible commentators have pointed out that in the, in the, the world of the Bible, the way that, that, that lifespans were measured and years were counted are a little bit different than the way that we do it. And that in, in reality, it, it's, it, it could be, and maybe is even likely that Abraham and Sarah are, are in their 30s. Uh, mid-30s at this point. Uh, again, it's, it's kind of like the years were counted differently, and so that's why we get these longer lifespans. And if that's the case, it, it does make sense that, that Abram would fear that these men would find his wife, probably in her 30s, attractive, who, whose body hadn't experienced the toll of half a dozen pregnancies um, like so many women her age. The point, though, however old she really is, here's the point, that Sarah is very physically attractive, and this is a real danger. Um, this is a real danger for them as they head into Egypt, into this foreign land. Abram's not just being paranoid about this. Remember that they're, they're refugees. They're immigrants, vulnerable, who are going into this place without protection and without much power. And, and Abram knows that it's possible that if some of these Egyptian men desire his wife, um, that that could mean that, that they would kill him and they would take her as their own. So, once again, we see Abram taking matters into his own hands. He comes up with a scheme. Here's the, here's the scheme. He says to her, please, say that you are my sister, so that it may go well with, you, or with me because of you, and that my life may be spared on your account. Now, I don't know about you, but I find this part of the story so troubling. I mean, not only does Abraham lie, although it could be kind of just like a half-truth, it's possible that in some way, you know, she was a kind of half-sister to him. Um, you know, that wasn't uncommon to marry somebody who was part of a more extensive family tree. There's also this Hebrew word that gets translated as sister, can be translated as other things too. Um, so it could be, you know, maybe at best a half-truth, or maybe it's just a bold-faced lie. But I think what's most troubling for me about this is not that Abraham lies, but it's the scheme, it's the plan that he comes up with. I mean, really? Is Abraham really considering a plan that puts his wife at risk to save his own skin? Is he really proposing that they pretend to be siblings so that other men can have their way with her and his life 
can be spared? I mean, what, what kind of husband would do this? I don't wanna let Abraham completely off the hook here, but I do wanna be careful not to be too hard on him. I think there is a little bit of sympathy, especially when you take into account this ancient Near Eastern culture. I mean, Abram's most, utmost concern is their survival. He and Sarah and, and this, this, the, the, you know, the, the, the hope of this promise, that's his concern. And this does provide a way in which their lives might be spared. Plus, several commentators think that, that maybe Abraham uh, had it in his mind that if he could pose as Sarah's brother, then that would actually, he would be able then in that way, they, that he wouldn't be killed, but he would be able then to come alongside her and be a relative who would, and, and that would give him the best chance to actually protect her because otherwise she would probably be without any kind of male relative protecting her and this would give him the best chance to pretend uh, that he was her brother to fend off suitors. The narrator continues then, when Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. So just like Abraham was concerned. And when the officials of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh. And the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her, uh, for her sake, he dealt well with Abraham. And he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male and female slaves, female donkeys, and camels. So Sarah, believed to be Abraham's sister, is taken into Pharaoh's harem. Uh, on account of Sarah, Pharaoh not only lets Abraham live, but showers him with all of this wealth, essentially is giving wedding gifts. And he's a wealthy guy. Livestock and servants to Abraham. And, and it seems like, again, this is part of what's maybe a little bit troubling, <laughs> is that this whole scheme seems to work out well for Abraham. You know, maybe kind of well for Sarah in terms of her life being spared, but I mean, I don't know. I, uh, the one that it certainly does not make uh, work out well for is Pharaoh, Pharaoh and his household. That's an important part in the story. Let me, let me read this next part. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with plagues because of Sarah, Abraham's wife, so Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this that you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say that she is my sister so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife, he says, take her and be gone. And Pharaoh gave his men orders concerning him and they sent, uh, set him on his way with his wife and all that he had. One of the interesting things about this part of the story is that so much of it actually anticipates what's gonna happen later for Abraham and Sarah's descendants. I mean, does this kind of foreshadow any other stories that you can think of that are coming? Uh, think of the story of their grandson, Jacob, and his sons and the famine that they would face and how Joseph, the favorite son of Jacob, would be sold into slavery by his brothers and taken to Egypt where God would save the Hebrews from the famine. Or think about the story after that, in the book of Exodus, when the Hebrews become Egyptian slaves and how God would work through Moses to bring plagues, 10 plagues on the Egyptians so that Pharaoh would let God's people go. So much in this part of the story foreshadows the experiences that are gonna come for later generations, but there are also some key differences here between this story and what will come later, especially in the Exodus, namely that Pharaoh is not necessarily the bad guy in this story. I mean, Friends, if, if we're looking to find fault for all that's happened, the primary place that blame really belongs is with Abraham. His deceit is what brought this plague, this curse on Pharaoh and his household. And Pharaoh ends up being generous to Abraham. I mean, generous to he and Sarah in spite of the trouble that they've brought upon him. So what do we do with this strange part of Abraham and Sarah's story? Well, there are some key things that we can learn. And let's kind of make a practical turn here. First, there are some key things I think we learn about Abraham in this part of the story. Um, while things got off to such a great start for Abraham, you know, those first nine verses of Genesis chapter 12, and it's true that, that Abraham, he really is a model of, of faith, of what it means to trust God and obey God even when the future is uncertain. That's true, 
But Abraham is no plastic saint. I mean, if, if we were tempted to put him up on a pedestal, like it doesn't take long in this story before he falls off and he falls off hard. Abraham is flawed and he is imperfect, just like we are. I mean, one moment he acts in this bold faith and then when things get hard, he lacks faith and he takes matters into his own hands. I mean, Abraham really has made a mess of things in this part of the story. I mean, God has called he and Sarah to be a channel of blessing to all the families of the earth, but here they are already not being a blessing to Pharaoh and his family, but they're being the opposite. They're bringing curse upon Pharaoh and his household. The tragic turn in this story then makes it look like due to Abraham's choices, this story of God's mission has gotten off track. Like what's at stake here is not just Abraham and Sarah's protection and survival, but it's the larger mission of God in the world. And it's like before this thing even really gets going, does this, does this just get completely derailed? I'm grateful by the way that Abraham and so many other characters in the Bible aren't plastic saints. I mean, how would we ever be able to relate to them if they were? I mean, instead, what they do is they're, they're like a mirror for us. They, they hold up a mirror, and when we read their stories, we see ourselves in them. That's what the narrator wants us to do, to see ourselves in Abraham and Sarah, in their belief and in their unbelief, in their heroic moments of faithfulness, in their tragic moments of failure, and everything in between. Second, we learn something, I think, important about this life of Barak of blessing that God promises us. Um, I think so often we assume that to be blessed means that things are gonna go well and we're gonna experience success and that we're not gonna have to experience hard things. I mean, when's the last time that you saw somebody post a picture like this on Facebook or social media, Instagram, and, and do the hashtag blessed? You know, your child melting down in the grocery store aisle or this picture with the hashtag blessed. No, we don't do that. We tend to think that a life of blessing means ease and comfort, again, that things are gonna go well for us. And when we experience trials and hardship and adversity, we find ourselves asking, you know, God, it, where, where is the life that you promised me? Jesus will reinforce this in the Sermon on the Mount when he, in, in the Beatitudes when he takes uh, our mental model of blessing and turns it upside down and says, here's who's really blessed. It's the poor. Uh, it's, it's those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. It's those who mourn. It's the peacemakers. It's those who are persecuted. So this life of blessing, friends, does not mean that there is gonna be a detour from hardship and pain. In fact, if anything, um, when we're faithful to God and answering his call and seeking to be a channel of blessing, there will be trouble and there will be hardship. Third, we learn something about Sarah here. And I don't wanna leave her out um, because she is such an important part of this story. If you thought that the star of this story was gonna be Abraham and that Sarah's kind of just along for the ride or just kind of a prop in the background, well, think again. Sarah is the one who shows courage and sacrifice here in this part of the story, not Abraham. His life is saved because of her. Now, I can't tell you how radical this is uh, for this particular time and culture. I mean, for women to be mentioned at all would be a big deal in a story, let alone to get named and certainly not to be cast in such an important role as Sarah is cast. I mean, whereas Abraham seems to be okay with passing Sarah off to Pharaoh, God is not okay with this. I want you to see that. This is the part where God intervenes. Um, God acts on behalf of Sarah. He shows how much he values her and how he is her protector and that he has a key role for her to play in this drama of redemption that is about to unfold. It's not just gonna be about Abraham. Uh, Sarah, Sarah is just as much a part of this story as he is. But neither of them are in the lead role. Neither of them are the central actors in this story and that's the fourth and final thing that I wanna point out that we learn from this story. In fact, this is the most important thing for us to learn. That this story, as we said last Sunday, is really about God. God is the central actor from beginning to end in Abraham and Sarah's story, the entire Bible, in your story and mine. That this is ultimately about who God is and how God is working through this couple who would become the people of Israel. And here's the thing even though it seems that this story has completely gone off track, 
we see that God in his faithfulness is still working, even in the mess of it all. Can I just say that again? Like if there's one thing I want you to take away from this sermon today, it's this, that even when it seems like the story, their life, our lives have gone off track, even when we make a mess, that God is faithful and God is working and none of that gets wasted. Even though Abraham chose not to remain in the place that God had called him and to trust that God would provide, God is faithful to Abraham. Even though Abraham takes matters into his own hands and comes up with this scheme that puts his wife at risk and brings curse upon Pharaoh and his household, God stays faithful. God works in the story to provide protection for Abraham and Sarah, especially Sarah, and to provide them for resources amidst the severe famine. And then God, in his mercy, gets Abraham and stories back on the right track. That's why we have to read the first two verses in chapter 13. If we end this part of the story with chapter 12, we're missing some of the most important part. Here's, here's what it says. So Abram went up from Egypt, he and his wife, and all that he had, and Lot with him, into Negev. Now Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver and in gold, and then listen to this part right here. This one's so important. He journeyed on by stages from the Negev as far as Bethel to the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Ai to the place where he had made an, made an altar to God at the first. And there he called on the name of the Lord. Do you see what's happening? The story gets way off track. But God in his faithfulness and mercy does a course correction. He brings Abraham and Sarah back to where they're supposed to be, back to where they were in Genesis chapter 12, verse eight, reminding them of his presence with them and his promises for them. And it's there at this place where Abraham first built the altar and called out to God that Abraham calls out to God again and once more our story is heading in the right direction. Let me close this way this morning. Here's my question for you. Where do you find yourself today? Where are you? Do you find yourself today feeling disappointed or confused or even anxious and fearful that things are not working out the way that you had, had expected in your life? Maybe you're even angry with God that he doesn't seem to be making good on his promises or maybe God feels silent to you right now. I think this can be especially confusing and frustrating when we feel like we were doing what God wanted us to do or going to the place where God wanted us to go and it just feels like God is not showing up, that this is not what we expected. Or maybe you find yourself today tempted to take matters into your own hands, struggling to really trust God. I mean, faith is not a kind of passivity where we just sit back on our hands and we don't take any responsibility, but we have to be so careful that when things get hard that we don't kind of get into that mode of overfunctioning. I do this all the time, trying to force things to happen, kind of saying to God, I'll, I'll take the steering wheel from here. Most of the time I'm acting out of my own anxiety or my need for control when I do that. When God is calling us, especially when it's hard, to rest our hearts in him, to trust him. Or maybe for you today, your life, if you're really honest, has gotten completely off track. Like you've made a big mess and it's off the rails. You've made a mess not just for yourself because of the choices you've made, but it's impacted others, maybe others who are close to you. Or maybe you're the person who's been impacted by the, by the poor choices of somebody else. Either way, you're wondering, is it possible for there to be a course correction like, is there a way forward or is it too late? This is where I just, I wanna speak to you where you're at today. Like, I wanna speak to your heart this morning. Friends, no matter where you find yourself today, can I tell you this is the good news of the gospel? This is the gospel in advance that Paul talked about, that our God is faithful even when we are not. This will remain such a strong theme throughout Abraham and Sarah's story, the whole Bible. God is always working. He is always bringing about his purposes in our lives and in the world, even when it's not evident, even when it, it looks like things have taken a turn for the worse. 
So let God bring you back today to the place where he wants to remind you who he is and remind you of his promises to you. And let him remind you of who you are. Put your trust in him today. Surrender your need for control to him. Let him be your provider and your protector. And let him, by his grace, help you to get your story back on the right track. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for this part of the story that shows us, one, that just because you've blessed us doesn't mean that things are always gonna go the way we want or that it's gonna be easy and free of struggle, but also because we see that even in Abraham's choices and some of the poor choices he makes, God, that you, that you stay in the story, you stay in his story, you stay in our story, and you are the God who is with us now, and your promises are true. Lord, whatever it is that we're struggling with today, wherever we find ourselves, Jesus, I pray that you would make your presence known to us this morning, that you would remind us of who you are, remind us of who we are, and that you are a God who gives new starts. You are a God who can get us back on track. So we yield our hearts to you today, Lord. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray these things. Amen. Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace. When fears are stilled, when striving cease. My comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless babe, this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as jesus died the wrath of god was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in the death of christ i live ground his body lay light of the world by darkness slain then bursting forth in glorious day up from the grave he rose again and as he stands in victory since curse has lost its grip Precious blood of Christ. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. On Christ the solid Kill.
dwelt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of Turns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. No power of hell, no human plan can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. Amen. So again, I want to say thank you to Meredith and Andy, Melinda, Ross, Joel, Chloe, uh, and we have a little bit of a studio audience here this morning, so it was kind of fun to have you all here too. Receive this benediction wherever you are today. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ go with you, strengthen you, provide for you, be your hope, your solid rock. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. Yeah, yeah.